Hey guys, King Gath here, and welcome to another episode of the King Gath Podcast. Uh, now, many times when I introduce my guests, I say things like, this person is directly responsible for partisan settlements. And once again, I have to say that, and it's very, very true, uh, because thanks to his his mod, and more than a mod, it's a whole system, Transfer Settlements, we have Rise of the Commonwealth today. So welcome, Mr. C. Dante. Hey, what's up? Hey, man. Uh, so transfer settlements is what I have to talk about first because that thing was such a huge game changer and it came out right around the same time as sim settlements. We both, uh, we both launched our stuff in like early 2017, I think. And, yeah. uh, as soon as I saw transfer settlements, I knew that was going to be like super big game. Um, and it's, it's, yeah. it's massive. I mean, there's probably almost a thousand blueprints out there now. Uh, close to it, I think. At least uh, seven or eight, eight hundred on Nexus. And yeah, I oh, think uh, we released our mods uh, maybe on the same week as well. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty big, pretty big day for uh, or week for settlement players. Absolutely. But yeah, the transfer settlements was one of those things when I saw it. It was like that should have been Bethesda's plan. Like they should have built into the game the ability to like share the share your settlement designs online. I don't know why they didn't. Yeah, it's a good question. Maybe because uh, you can't really do something like that on uh, each platform, just on PC. I don't know, Maybe. but uh, if you if you uh, look at seventy six, uh, they did something like that. At least uh, you can uh, transfer your camp for for yourself if you want to move it. So uh, obviously uh, they they wanted to do something like that uh, when they were working on. Uh, Fallout 4 as well, or yeah. just just had that uh, idea in mind, at least. Right. Yeah, their blueprint system. Their blueprint system has got some really cool features in 76. In fact, I wouldn't be shocked if that turns out to be one of their patches is the ability to share your blueprints with each other, because that would be for that way people who are really good designers could you know hand out their designs to other people or maybe even sell them it might be a cool feature yeah it would be a cool feature although again i don't know how uh, would they pull that off on uh, xbox and ps4 but right. uh, but sure and uh, of course uh, when uh, when private servers will be launched on on pc and uh, the other platforms as well i'm i'm gonna try to implement transfer settlements for that game as well so at least on ah, PC, okay. there would be a way to to share your camp builds, uh, oh, same way as with great. Fallout Four. I'm sure, a lot of people would like that, especially if they can figure out kind of the approximate position of where you put it, so they could get it pretty close to yours. Because I know there's some people like Cordless who post their builds up and describe how to build them, and I think a lot of people would enjoy being able to have those exact exact systems in their own game. Yeah. Yeah. What would be even more amazing is to be able to do this uh, cross-platform. Uh, I had ideas how to uh, export a settlement from Xbox to PC. I, I'm not sure I would be able to do the same uh, on PS4 without uh, being able to use custom scripts. But yeah. but on Xbox I was uh, experimenting with uh, hood framework and uh, QR codes. So you would be able to create a script uh, that uh, then shows up uh, the same settlement data as a QR code or a, more like a sequence of QR codes on Xbox with hood so framework. Then you just and then snap a, snap a picture on your phone and upload them. Yeah. Uh, I probably would uh, implement some sort of uh, application for for uh, your phone that uh, could catch that uh, sequence of QR codes and then save it as a blueprint that you can then use on PC. So at oh, least yeah. that was the idea. I say we should stop talking about that or you're going to get people's hopes up because that sounds amazing. <laughs> thing <laughs> and is, also, I think, thing is, uh, I think people will be blown away if they're just like, uh, if they go to download a mod that says, download the companion app from the iTunes. People will be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I already talked about that, so that's okay. It's just something I have mm -hmm. uh, on my backlog and something I want to do with Fallout 4 at least at some point. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's so many of those projects that get added to the backlog of like you start to see a, a glimpse of something. Like here, I'll throw one out there so that I can join you in the getting uh, getting assaulted by people asking when it's happening. Is I've always had the idea of, and it, it actually I got the idea from looking at the way transfer settlements works. So for those of you who don't know, the way transfer settlements works effectively is it take it takes all of the data in the settlement, analyzes it, and it dumps it out to a text file, and uh, that's that's capable or that's possible thanks to the script extender. Yeah. Well, the script extender can also obviously read files in because you can import those text files into the game. So what, I, what I've always wanted to do, and it's another one of those things that just gets added to the backlog because it'll take a long time and I don't want to get distracted from my existing projects, is to tap into the Twitch API and allow it to dump text files in for me to read based on people like basically i could read the chat log in with f4se mm -hmm. and then respond to people's things so you could set up commands to allow twitch users to donate to cause a raid on a settlement or to cause something to explode or to drop items into the player like give them wood in the game or something just stuff like that to where mm -hmm. it could become more of an interactive experience because one of the things i'm i'm finding when i watch people because i like to watch people stream some settlements just to see how people are playing the mod. It gives me a good idea how to improve it. And I see that it's it's kind of boring to watch people play Bethesda games, but it could be really fun to have them being able to interact with uh, you know donations and commands to pull stuff off. So I, I always that's an idea I've always had floating in the back of my head. Absolutely, it keeps getting added to that backlog of like that's going to take a lot of time. I'm going to have to learn the Twitch API and F4SE, and so I just keep uh, keep pushing it off to one day. Well, it's a great idea. So if you if you want to help, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> yeah, but I don't. You have enough. You have a chart. I'm sure that's just as big, if not bigger, than mine of ideas you'd like to do one day. So we should. Uh, yeah. We should avoid going down that yeah, road but, of adding any more giant. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, for example, if you say you want to do something like that, uh, that's uh, always uh, more motivating than just going through my backlog and see what I have. Uh, I don't know. Uh, true, I'd like true. to do next or something. Uh, so right, yeah. Also, uh, well, you're. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, also, I have. I was going to uh, say your your next project. Your next project is very exciting, and I think you're almost done with it too. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to well maybe uh, in a couple of days uh, I I can call it a beta and uh, there's a closed uh, test channel on my. Uh, discord for it and uh, it's about uh, well practically importing uh, transfer settlements blueprints into the creation kit but I'm doing it uh, with a Fallout 4 edit FO edit uh, FO4 edit uh, script so mm -hmm. so it's uh, uh, gonna need uh, X edit or FO4 edit uh, for the script okay. to to for you to be able to run it but uh, then uh, it will create an esp plugin file so practically a mod uh, based on your uh, settlement build that uh, you have exported with transfer settlements and then you can uh, open it in the creation kit and do anything that you want with it and then uh, you can also uh, release it as a mod for even for Xbox or PS4. Yeah, that's incredible. And I think like anybody who's a mod author hears that and understands exactly the, what that means. Any of you listening who are not mod authors, uh, I mean the the PS4 thing is pretty amazing. And obviously it'll be it'll be limited to items that are available on PS4 obviously. So it would probably yeah. be limited strictly to DLC, Creation Club and base game assets that uh, were built with. Yes. Obviously like mod added items that aren't S calls aren't going to work for PlayStation users, but still that's huge for PlayStation users effectively to get access to a lot of transfer settlements blueprints. And this is actually so uh, Donald Strong and I did a podcast and we talked about this a little bit and I think we prodded you in the podcast of like see Dante get on it, make this happen. And now you're making it happen. So now now it's my turn I guess. I'm going to have to to return the favor is we've already been dreaming up how we might be able to use this technology to exactly get exactly a... what i was talking about <laughs> earlier that uh, these these kind of things when i when i uh, listen to a podcast with you and donald and uh, hear uh, how amazing it would be if i could pull it pull it off uh, one day that uh, that is yeah. the kind of stuff that motivates me to you know uh, not just pick something from uh, my backlog of uh, planned uh, mods but uh, 
but focus on some something that uh, that is really important for others as well. Speak. Yeah, that that is hugely important, and I, I think it, if you release it, I, I will definitely add it to my plan list to come up with a light version of some settlements for uh, PlayStation Four one day. I don't know how long it'll take me, but uh, but that's the tool that will enable it to be possible. So that's what I thank wanted you for to putting in the effort. That's what I wanted to uh, ask you about that. So it, it is the plan uh, to to release a, a light version of uh, Sim Sim Settlements Sim Settlements sort, uh, with sort that uh, tool, so, or or you can. Uh, so what I think, or you can think uh, use it do, uh, for any an, uh, uh, any other uh, projects. Oh yeah, we have as well. I have. I mean, once you told me you were actually doing it, I immediately came up with all sorts of cool ideas we can do with it. But um, so play, getting. I, I love to support as many platforms as possible. I mean, many people have heard me talk about how I refuse sure. to go to to do, um, uh, what's it called, uh, script extender mm -hmm. work because I want my stuff to work on Xbox. It's like there's a larger audience available. I want to hit as many people as possible. PlayStation was just out of out of reach, and it still kind of is. Like, there's no way they're ever going to get the full fledged Sim Settlements experience. Right. But as Don and I talked about, it, what we could probably do, oh, well, I'm positive we could do this with existing scripts that exist in the game is I could set up essentially a series of quests that run in the background and then you basically would do something to trigger them whether it build a specific workshop object and it would basically build the level one version of a city plan and then that would start a timer and then after you know that timer changes over or after the timer finishes then the next level of the city plan could appear and we could do that based on with the work you're doing because we'd be able to import each of the city layers and set them up with enable disable parents and just have those toggles. So it would be very simple and it wouldn't have the plot aspect. So we would need to do a lot of work to redesign city plans. But my my hope would be to set up some sort of template system mm -hmm. to where essentially we, you take this base template mod I have and then you combine it with your tools and it would allow uh, other content creators to release basically a sim settlements esque system so it's going to take a while to get to that and because, especially because we've already got we've got conqueror in development and we've got the next expansion in development so this would have to happen after all of that but it is something i would love to do and i think your tools will make that feasible well it's good to have plans for <laughs> for the upcoming years until a new yeah, bet as the game studios games uh is gonna get, get released <laughs> Right, and from according to the last time I heard Todd Howard speak in public, he made it sound like it's going to be years before we see another one. Exactly, exactly. Well, I'm I'm uh, still hopeful that uh, Starfield may uh, get released, uh, maybe uh, by the end of uh, 2020, but uh, I mm, it may be wishful thinking of my part. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Because they, I gotta figure they've been blowing up the size of their studios lately. Like they've, mm -hmm. they've t converted Austin over. They've converted. Um, I'm trying to remember what the last the studio before that that they converted was it Montreal that they made. Basically, they've had two studios recently that they made subsidiaries of Bethesda Game Studios. Like there are other branches of it. That's true. That's true. But uh, they also have to constantly create new stuff for seventy six. They have to create uh, uh, other cross. Blades. They they right. probably they still have uh, some some uh, creation kit stuff. Uh, oh, uh, I mean creation club uh, stuff uh, planned. So right. I don't know, but uh, yeah, they. I, I would say hopeful. I would. Well, my thought was that they are probably they probably need some time to adjust. They've got to train all of those people to work the way they do. They've got to get them everybody make sure everybody's on board with their software. So whether they're using obviously they're using the creation kit for seventy six, but for blades they're probably not. They're probably using some other game engine or you know maybe whether it's Unity or Unreal or their own custom thing or maybe they did use a creation kit. I don't know. But the um, mm -hmm. looking at that game, it doesn't look like they did. And, yeah. Uh, I would say they, they're going to need. There's going to be some adjustment period to get their team tripled in size effectively because they were, they've always been known for being one of the scrappier studios. Like they were always running at just around just over 100 people at the Maryland studio. So for them to triple in size, that's going to take some time before they can really get everybody up to speed and operating like the core studio does. So I'm I'm hopeful that these these couple of games, so 76 Blades and stuff, are kind of the first product that those teams are releasing, and that 
once they've kind of come to their own that they'll be able to release stuff a little more quickly and better <laughs> to like not so not releasing these bug fests that uh like 76 was i mean blades what, what are your thoughts on blades so far i'm i i've been playing it a little bit it's pretty it's i haven't had any bugs yet so that's good well i haven't tried it yet i i tried to get into the uh, the beta or this early access but i haven't sure. uh, uh got any uh, message from bethesda yet um well uh, based on what i what i saw uh uh, from youtubers and other uh, sources um, it looks interesting but uh, i don't know maybe maybe i will uh, get uh, hooked on it uh, while mm. you know it's a mobile game so uh, might as well play that game uh, instead of uh, anything else on my uh, phone but uh, as a mod maker, I'm not so excited. Obviously, uh, may yeah. maybe I'm um, much more into the Fallout franchise than the Elder Scrolls franchise, and I I love Skyrim, but uh, I'm not into the Elder Scrolls lore that much as I am into the Fallout lore. So we'll see. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm the same way. I definitely uh, gonna try it out for sure. I think they made it, they just announced a couple of days ago that it was available for everyone now, but I'm not sure if that's every country or if it was limited to a U.S. release because oh. it's still technically early access, mm -hmm. but I know they're past the they're past the sign-up point. It's supposedly available to everybody, so maybe it's just not in your country. I don't know. Then I'm going to have to check my phone, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so so far, uh, well, I was curious uh, what you thought about it as far as, because I'm really curious what engine they built it in, first of all, because mm -hmm. it has... A lot of elements that are similar to Skyrim. The NPCs look the same as far as, you know, they've got this, there's this Bethesda animation style to them that when you see, you see a game walk, you see NPCs walking around in a Bethesda game and they have this certain look to them. You can just identify it and it has that kind of thing going on and it uses a lot of the sound effects from Skyrim. So it has a lot of similar elements. I personally don't have any time for mobile gaming. So I used mm -hmm. to play a lot of Hearthstone during my commute, but I don't have a commute anymore. I work. I work from home now, so it's uh, it's hard to find any time to actually play a mobile game. So I've played a little bit of Blades, and it was not obviously it's no mobile game is going to be as compelling as a PC or console game. So it's pretty hard for me to find any reason to want to play this game. I have to specifically say, all right, well during this time I'm just going to sit down on my couch and play a mobile game, and I don't ever have time to do that. So it's uh, it's not really to me it's not good enough to be worth my time. And uh, it's getting it's getting reamed pretty hard in articles and on YouTube over how many microtransactions are in it, which is disappointing. Yeah, I heard. And it it's it is loaded with them. I uh -huh. I've never seen so many. It's been it's been a while since I've seen that many microtransaction screens popping up or like opportunities to spend uh, real world money in a in a game, which was just again yeah. unfortunate. I don't. I mean, I get, I get why they're doing it, and I guess they've already made a lot of money. It's, mm -hmm. it's ultimately, to me, to me, it looks like this is this is my hope, and this is me being the an eternal optimist here. Is uh, I'm hoping that these game companies who do stuff like this, so like Bethesda, I you know I always want to treat them as holier than others because I have such a near and dear love for for their franchises. I'm hoping that these games like 76 and Blades are a way for them to just perpetually have an income source that they can reinvest into their core games and so that we see bigger and better and more awesome features in Tez 6 and Starfield and Fallout 5 and that's that's my hope I, I don't know how accurate that is because it's hard to tell how much of the corporate influence is hitting the actual game studios because we're seeing it all over the place right now in the industry with like uh, uh, Blizzard's in trouble for it right now Bioware is in trouble for it, like all sorts of EA games, like all these game companies are getting slammed for putting the microtransactions and money over the actual gameplay. And so it's like a big issue right now. And you hate to see that happening to our favorite game company. That's true. That's true. And uh, uh, yeah, I uh, I mean, we, we can never see the numbers behind the scenes, obviously, but uh, uh, one can't think that they already made a ton of money with like Fallout Shelter or or Skyrim or Fallout 4. But of course, uh, 
again we can't see the number and uh, we can't see the new investments and uh, what uh, those uh, cost uh, for the company yeah. but uh, the way they did uh, micro transactions in in follow shelter i think that's uh, that's a more I, more sympathetic way for me at least I, yeah, I, I thought it was fine. I, yeah. I never even noticed them in that. Yeah. Like, I played that game a ton, and I never felt annoyed by the microtransactions. You you never felt like you cannot play the game until you wait an hour or or, or you pay some money. Of course, there were, were those lunchboxes, but those, were, those felt like uh, just uh, a bonus that uh, you either pay for or you don't. And you can simply right. continue playing the game as normal. Yeah, yeah. I think that was one of the the better games I felt as far as they put them in there, but I didn't feel like they were clobbering me over the head, and I didn't feel they were necessary to to commence. Blades is feeling more like in your face, like it's mm-hmm. uh, there's there's this uh, I don't know if you ever watch Family Guy, but there's this there's this episode I always think about, and it was uh, some guy pulls out his wallet. You want to see my kids? And he starts smashing the wallet into the guy's face, and that's always <laughs> what I think about when I think of microtransactions because they're getting more and more like that to where they're. They're like pop-ups in the middle of your game or between yeah, yeah. You know, the load screen telling you about how you can sp- spend money. And it's like, ugh, it's cringy. It's cringy to watch all that. Yeah, I think I, I saw that episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pre- It's been pretty memed heavily. Yeah. That's always what comes to mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so so seventy so seventy six wise, what did you feel about, how do you feel about their microtransaction systems? I know you've played that game a bit. I think they are, they could be fine. I mean, same as with the Creation Club, it's something you can buy or not. And if you do, if you decide to not buy anything from the Atom Shop in '76, you can still play the game and and uh, nothing happens. And on top of that, you can also earn those atoms uh, playing the game, of course. But uh, my only issue, of course, with the Atom Shop or Atomic Shop, I don't know. <laughs> Um, is the pricing, of course, because uh, that's yeah. that's ridiculous. It's like, yeah, it's if you if you plan I've to to just uh, pay money for actual uh, skins or or new types of power armor skins and and I don't know uh, buy for money uh, for money you buy like a couple of them you you almost pay the whole price of the the actual game. Yeah, those the prices that are that they're creeping up on are getting crazy, and it's not just for seventy six. It's all all the games. I mean, I think it was, uh, I think it's Black Ops Four that has like a thirty dollar hammer in it or something like that. Like that's that's been a mm-hmm. thing that's been tweeted over and over again. The the prices that they're putting in for something that has zero reproduction cost is insane, just insane. Yeah, it's uh, and it feels predatory because the people that they're 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 hitting on a small percentage of the market. They're hitting on whales these people who have you know addictive compulsive behavior toward toward getting the things they want and kids and i and i see this with my my nephews is that they are constantly begging everybody that uh that anybody who will listen to buy them things in in fortnite and it's like they have no concept of what money's worth like the ki- like the kid seven he doesn't know the difference between you know a dollar and fifty dollars it's all it's all funny to him so like the, yeah. the fact that that's effectively who they're preying on it just feels it feels slimy to me especially those prices yeah that's the scariest part of it yeah because uh, for me and you uh, I mean I think we are about the same age uh, we can decide to not uh, buy something because uh, even though we could afford I don't know 50 bucks for a power armor skin we just uh, <laughs> have principles and not pay 50 <laughs> bloody uh, dollars for a power armor skin so yeah it's uh it's scary when when kids are getting hooked on those microtransactions well and i think i think that's why we're we're seeing more and more of them too is that we're all we're also we're aging out of the target audience for gaming companies so probably that's that's uh, another thing is that you know we've we've played games our whole lives so we've always assumed that they're going to be marketing toward us but in reality the you know the majority of the money is probably going to be to generation after ours now so we're we're getting left behind a little and i think that's part of where all the rage comes from if you listen to most of the youtube game game reviewers and people who are in the scene talking about what's going on in it 
tends to be a lot of anger, and I think it's because a lot of them are all in that 30-something range of, you know, they're just no longer the target audience. Or they are parents. Right, or they're now parents, yeah. So that, that's my. That's definitely been one of the things that's gotten me annoyed by it, is I, lo- I look at my nephews getting hooked on this stuff, and I'm like, that's going to be my kids soon. Yeah, uh, He's going to be playing with my phone and, and wanting me to buy stuff. And I guess it's becoming, not only is it they're targeting younger generation, but these younger generations grew up on... Uh, cell phones and stuff where these games and these microtransactions were just the normal to where it's just going to seem like it, that's why we're starting to see it in $60 games is because I think the next generation of gamers is just so used to seeing it. It, it doesn't even phase them anymore. It's just like that's just part. Of, oh, that's just part of gaming now. But we all we grew up on, you know, you pay 50 bucks for a game or 60 bucks for a game and, and the game is there. Everything you get in it. In fact, for some in some cases, you would get additional content for free after the fact. Yeah, and that's that's the problem that it's it's getting uh, to be the standard. And uh, those YouTubers you mentioned are uh, probably fighting uh, against that. And yeah, uh, yeah and it's, yeah, and it's our, a good fight in that regard. Yeah, and our generation simply just uh, remembers at, uh, simpler times when <laughs> you just <laughs> bought a game and uh, it was a complete game and uh, you uh, didn't have to pay. Uh, I don't know half price or or. Uh, the full price again for any extra yeah yeah it's a it's unfortunate that this it's dominating the conversation too because it's not interesting to talk about like it's not interesting to bitch and complain about microtransactions all the time it would be nicer to talk about how cool features are in games which is why i love i love modding so much and why i'm obsessed with the bethesda games i think is is we can take them and morph them and add whatever we want to them and add these cool features and we can essentially create things that are way beyond any microtransaction or dlc content and and like totally change the feel of the game on our own we can just kind of just have at it which is so much fun exactly and exactly why it is more exciting to me to to look forward to the next uh, single player rpg game from bethesda because uh, yeah. I know yeah, I, I, I will be able to, to mod it, and, and that's uh, more exciting for me now than the actual game. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I spend so little time playing the game now because I'll sit down, and, I, and, and, and I'll still get excited to play the game sometimes. Like, I'll, I'll look through new mods that come out, and I'm like, oh, that sounds so awesome. And then, mm-hmm. I'll, you know, in my head, I'll run through the scenarios of like, oh, yeah, and they could do this and this and this. But then when it comes down to it, I'll sit down on my computer, and instead, I just want to create. I just want to. It's like, wait, what could? What? What else could I add? That inspires me to now add this other thing. And then, I find all the time that I normally would have for gaming is now instead dropped into the creation kit or or uh, X edit. Will you be able to complete the next uh, Bethesda RPG uh, before actually start so. modding it? <laughs> I hope so. I don't know. That'll be. I mean, it depends on. So I'm not. I'm not into x edit as much as most people so i do i still do the majority mm-hmm. of my work in the creation kit so like for me it's gonna be once they release the creation kit of any game is when i'm gonna really be excited to mod it because it's for like people can already mod 76 to an extent using the latest version of x edit yeah. i haven't bothered but part of that is because i'm not interested in 76 anymore but uh the yeah so like i and also i don't want to I personally don't want to be the first necessarily. I want to do things that are good. Like I'm, I'm interested in quality more than rushing to the to be the front. So, <laughs> and it's just easier to work out of the creation kit. I can do better work there. <laughs> um, I'm just laughing because uh, I was the first with 76 on Nexus mods, <laughs> and it was <laughs> it was just a bloody uh, replacer for the main menu. You yeah. know the background animation. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's it can be fun to be the first in doing those things. I just don't find it; it's not important enough to me to like rush out and do that. So I might end up complete. So to me, it's it's a matter of will I complete the game before modding it, or will I even complete the game at all because I'm busy modding Fallout Four still? Yeah, that's my question. I don't know. It depends on how it, it'll, it'll have to be a damn good game. It definitely can't be like seventy six. Do, do you still play it? I know you played at launch and during beta. I stopped playing it around. January, I think. Okay. So um, you got a couple of months out of it. Yeah, well, yeah. It wasn't that intense <laughs> than, uh, as, as with uh, Fallout 4. With Fallout 4, I think uh, I played like 300 hours in the first 
30 days i think that's wow <laughs> that's a lot that's nuts and that uh, yeah and that that was the point when i uh, uh start started to uh look for uh some workaround with uh, some of the shortcomings of the game. I mean, after 300 hours, you you pretty much know everything about the game, and uh, that's when I started to look for mods, and that started everything for me. So yeah, yeah. I, I that's... started started modding with Fallout 4. Uh, that's actually. one of my that's one of my favorite things to do during a Bethesda game is to take notes during the game of mm -hmm. shortcomings so that I know what mods to look for. And it's something I don't do in any other game because the chances of, like, there's all, you know, there's mods for tons of games now, yeah. but no, nothing ever like a Bethesda game where you can count on something coming out for every need eventually. Um, well, there are some games, like, for example, XCOM, XCOM 2 comes close, I think. Uh, I... Uh, I could uh, almost uh, I, I could find all for uh, uh, mods for almost a, a anything uh, for that game uh, so far, but uh, but yeah, but as the games are definitely up there, uh, and uh, uh, what I was gonna say was with seventy six. You said Fallout Four was your. You said Fallout 4 was your first game yeah, modded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I uh, started to, I don't know, uh, install mods like uh, like uh, you know, map replacers, for example. Uh, I really like that uh, satellite uh, map mod uh, in the early days of Fallout 4 modding. And actually that, uh, that uh, eventually led me to start uh, modding the game because uh, all I wanted to do is uh, modify that texture to show the mm -hmm. the unmarked locations of the game okay so I learned yeah. uh, what a DDS file was and uh, I, I jumped into Photoshop and and put uh, the unmarked locations on that uh, map texture and that was the first time I modified the game for myself and after that I started to work on other texture stuff interesting because I because I think I first saw your stuff was your name was appearing on a lot of the radio stations like aren't you the one who put together old world radio Boston yeah old world radio was one of those early mods as well that I really liked and I, I just constantly listening to the stations while I was uh, creating settlements building my settlements and uh, they also provided these uh, uh, radio uh, receivers that you could, uh, same as with the vanilla stations, you could uh, just uh, build at uh, at your settlements. And I was, I had this idea to retexture those radios uh, according to the theme of the radio station. And uh, right, right. and I showed that uh, to uh, Brandoman, the author of Woodward Radio. That's uh, that was the first time I PM'd uh, him on Nexus, and uh, he really liked those uh, retextures, and uh, we started a conversation. By that time, I I already uh, knew some scripting stuff and. Uh, uh, some plugin related uh, stuff uh, in Exedit, and uh, I had a few more suggestions about uh, Oddworld Radio, like for example, uh, a FOMOD installer, so you can uh, you can have a, an installer menu when you when you install Oddworld Radio uh, through a mod manager like Nexus Mod Manager. And uh, then one thing led to the other, and I started to help out with Oddworld Radio as a as a more technical person. And right, because uh, you saw you solved the you solved that one issue they had with the number of stations, because that's where that that famous cat story comes from. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what was the what was the limitation you had to solve there? With that, that limitation required a cat. <laughs> yeah, so 
when you have a radio station playing actively in your P-Boy or you have a radio receiver around in the loaded game area somewhere so the player can uh, hear that radio station then everything is fine but uh, after you uh, after the go uh, that uh, station goes passive so for example you start to you turn off your P-Boy radio or you, you start to listen to an other radio station, then after a while, uh, those uh, radio stations that are passive and uh, you cannot hear them, they just uh, start skipping through tracks instead of actually uh, playing the, the wave files, the, the audio files uh, uh, through. Uh, right. And uh, that was a problem because uh, with Old World Radio the concept was that uh, the order of the, the tracks within a radio station is important. For example, especially for those type of radio stations that are like uh, uh, audio dramas, for example. And yeah. uh, you, you just uh, listen to, for example, episode one of uh, a very long uh, radio drama. You just... Uh, I don't know switch to another channel to to just uh, listen to a song and you skip back to the radio drama and all of a sudden it's not episode one anymore but episode 26 so it was really sure. really annoying so what i came <laughs> came up with is uh just uh silently placing uh uh markers around the player that uh that act as a uh, in-game uh, radio receivers, just like the one that you can actually see in the game and and listen to. But these were completely invisible, invisible and completely silent, so you could uh, you couldn't tell that uh, uh, anything uh, were happening. But uh, but uh, those uh, kept those inactive stations alive in the background. So I just, uh, for three seconds, I, I spawn uh, uh, a marker like that, that acts, acts uh, as a radio. And uh, that's enough for the next track to actually uh, not uh, be skipped, but, uh, but actually uh, played through. And then uh, I delete that marker from the game. But uh, at first, uh, this wasn't a marker, but uh, it was an invisible cat, because for for some reason i i thought it was a good idea and that and that version was well, you could have the radio uh, station follow you then um it was uh it was uh, uh, completely ghosted and and invisible and silenced but for some reason uh, uh sometimes uh, the cat fell into a water or it disturbed your your sneak uh, meter or <laughs> things like that and that's how players figured out that something is not right and that version <laughs> that version of uh, Oddworld Radio was out for like two days and then I, I fixed it with this marker solution but uh, fortunately or unfortunately uh, somehow f from a very old bug report uh, someone did uh, this out and then uh, Kotaku <laughs> uh, pick, picked up this story as an article but it was okay See, I, it wasn't spiteful when I heard about that I assumed what you were trying to do was have the cat, invisible cats follow the player around to keep the station alive no, so I was like, like oh that. that's clever gave them an AI package so they're just literally walking behind the player keeping the radio alive no, no it was just uh, <laughs> for some reason I thought it has to be an actor that's that's it ah okay and yeah because the because you tend to set up so the way the radios are set up is essentially they're they're non-npcs talking is the way they're they, yeah that's what they look like yeah. in the ck because yeah. yeah. they're set up like yeah. dialogue scenes yeah exactly and uh, for some reason i i thought it has to be an actor and uh, the cat was the smallest actor i could think of in the vanilla <laughs> game but then i realized that's it's so uh, it's it's not an actor script it's an object reference script so it can be anything it can be a marker and that's it so yeah it was stupid of me to to use an actual actor for it but that's oh, but it. that's 
that's what's awesome about about the modding though is and and it's <laughs> i don't think it's just modding i think in gaming i think in game programming or any programming in general a lot of the solutions are very hacky and and just kind of see what works it's just like you you've got a released product and you're like all right well we need this to happen we didn't build it into the engine so we're gonna have to come up with something and that's what you do and, and that's that that is a, that is exactly how that uh, kotaku article approached this story so it was positive after all so i i did, yeah. uh, didn't mind that uh, that article <laughs> came out of this yeah, they weren't trashing you or anything. It was just kind of like uh, this is kind of some of the behind the scenes stuff that happens. Yeah, yeah, it definitely happens more in mods, but I mean, there's plenty of stuff in in video games, especially older games, and uh, and actually, it start it's you can find a lot of that a lot of weird stuff, and I don't have any examples off the top of my head to give, but you can find it in in games that were built on an engine that weren't designed to do what they do. So I bet, for example, EA is now known for forcing all of their game companies, all their subsidiary companies, to use the Frostbite engine, yeah. even though it wasn't designed to be to handle all of these sorts of games and so i'm sure they have tons of weird hacky solutions going on yeah, under yeah. the hood to make them do what they need yeah that but. kotaku article also mentioned that uh, developers do this to not just modders these uh yeah. kind of hacky uh solutions that you can only see if uh, you can uh, see behind the scenes right Oh yeah, I mean we use tons of hacky solutions in mods, especially with the Bethesda games, because there are certain strange limitations. For example, one of the things I'm really, really hopeful for in future iterations of the Creation Engine is for them to introduce an easier way for us to interact with the UI without having to replace mm -hmm. with files. Because right now that's probably one of the biggest sources of hacks I think that we all have to use is come up with like weird, bizarre ways to interact, to allow the player to do things. So right now we use heavily rely on hollow tapes, but those are super limited because they can't be fully dynamic. They can with F4SE. I think we figured out, you figured it out with the dynamic terminal system with the, what's it called? Terminal extensions? Uh, well, that's uh, actually a code borrowed, borrowed from Ratch 2 k but uh, he never released it, so he said I can uh, use it for transfer settlements and pack it with uh, transfer settlements. But that's how, that's how you're able to get a fully dynamic holotape, but for the most part, that's not even possible in the vanilla game. So yeah. we, we, almost ha we almost have no way to get a fully dynamic user interface. Not only can we not do a fully dynamic holotape, we can't even do dynamic message buttons. Mm -hmm. So you have to pre-plan everything and it gets very, so it gets very hacky very quickly to interact to allow the player to interact with mods and so you end up with for example sim settlements uses a system that somebody suggested to me a long time ago uh, some uh, uh, using using the, uh, the container container containers uh, yeah menu. And that's, yeah that's clever yeah i know it works well enough but it's it's got some issues of its own sometimes the game doesn't register the the event on time or mm -hmm. if too many of those events fire at once you can crash the game pretty easily with the on item on item added event so it's uh lots of hacks in the ui so that's one of the things i think is, is strongly needed in bethesda games we need like some we need like an mcm framework built right into the into the game for us yeah well if you take a look at uh the work of nianka or or Rage 2k there's a lot of that can be achieved still with the ui but uh, of course, uh, obviously, it's not uh, not the e not the easiest part of uh, modding, and and uh, it's uh, usually involves uh, modifying uh, some of the vanilla menus and uh, and inject your your own menus or your own uh, modifications uh, into those, and that's uh, exactly right. how most of uh, the. 76 uh, mods are working as well because you can't really create a new uh, ESP plugin right now for 76 that you can just simply load up right. but, but uh, you can you can do these uh, replacers and uh, one of the one of the most uh, or more exciting uh, type of replacer for 76 I think are these UI mods right now Oh yeah, that was that was pretty much the only mod I was using when I was playing Server Six was mm -hmm. Reg Two K's new inventory thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a a pain in the butt to organize all the food in that game. Of, yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so that was that was nice, but it, it would be nice to see core. So I, I, this was one of the things, uh, one of the big improvements they made jumping from Skyrim to to uh, Fallout Four for modders was 
they made they exposed the all of the animation information and made it a lot easier for us to inject custom inf animations, which was always a problem in older games. And so I'm hoping that to me, as far as I can tell, I don't. Know, let me ask you that: What do you think is lacking? What are we still lacking control of in the creation engine? Because to me, the one that jumps out is UI. But maybe there are some other things I haven't thought about. Good question. Mm, let me think. Um, UI is definitely one. Um, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, we do have uh, access to uh, all the all the aspects of modding uh, by by now by by the time of Fallout Four, but uh, but maybe uh, we could uh, have access to more of the tools that Bethesda is using. And uh, right, yeah, they've. Yeah, I wonder what I wonder. I always wonder what other stuff they have to keep from us for licensing reasons. Yeah. Whereas yeah and also of course uh, those stuff that uh, you can only do with uh, the script extender because uh, that's uh, that's always going to be a pc only mod when you when you yeah. rely on the script extender and i don't know how this uh, can be uh, achieved or could be achieved but uh, uh, it would be great if uh, when when modders or uh, the the amazing uh, team behind the script extender uh, just uh, 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 add something uh, new, some new functionality, some new features to the Papy Papyrus engine, then then Bethesda could uh, add that for modders as well. Yeah, I, I it would, there's de well, there's definitely a lot less missing in fallout 4 than there was for skyrim so if you look at the, the number of functions that the script extender adds to skyrim it's far higher than what's added to fallout 4 and i can't tell if that's because we just don't need them like we don't need a ton more because i find there's only a couple of things i can't do there's two things i found i can't do in fallout 4 from natively with papyrus one is to interact with individual instance data for inventory items which mm -hmm. makes it very difficult to do things like a proper armory or yeah or auto equipping or anything and then the other one is interacting with the power grid those are the two things that seem to be happening <laughs> but almost everything else is is possible right in base papyrus which is pretty impressive uh yeah speaking of the power grid i had uh, had my fair <laughs> share of uh, issues with it too uh, lately because um, you actually you have that working do you have it fully working with transfer settlements or does it have some quirks still with transfer settlements, yeah, because the script extender uh, handles it dynamically. But uh, also with uh, this new tool uh, we were talking about, uh, the tool that would uh, convert uh, a settlement blueprint into a plugin, an ESP plugin. Uh, yeah, I had I had to um, convert uh, that uh, power grid data from the blueprint uh, into an actual power grid. Uh, uh, matrix uh, or array uh, onto the workshop reference and uh, that's cool and all and it's working as well I, so, I also had to uh, register the, the exact, exact uh, connect points, wire connect points of uh, each uh, individual items uh, in a blueprint to be able to uh, perfectly place uh, a wire spline into into the ESP plugin so it looks like as uh, it would look like when uh, you actually uh, connected those items in workshop mode okay but the problem is that uh, uh, so let let's uh, say uh, I uh, for example convert uh, let's say output Zimonja, uh, I don't know if I uh, pronounce it correctly, uh, settlement into uh, an ESP plugin, a, a Zimonja build into a, an ESP plugin. And uh, mm -hmm. of course, uh, you take that, you take your uh, uh, wire grid from the transfer settlement blueprint and uh, you put that data onto the vanilla workshop as an override. Uh, an override of the vanilla workshop reference into your newly created ESP plugin, and that's 
uh, that's fine if uh, if you if you already uh, uh, I mean if you never uh, unlock that settlement and you never build anything uh, at that settlement before instant uh, installing that new ES ESP plugin but if you already did uh, build something then uh, the game would uh, just uh, read the power grid data from your save game and not from a plugin level because ah, because uh, if it would uh, if it would read the power grid gate uh, data from the plugin then uh, that installed plugin were continuously override your power grid instead of right, using right. using what you had uh, created in your save game so, so that's that, probably going to pose a it's probably going to pose a problem for my original plan of what I talked about for the potential PS4 version where we would have different layers sounds like I'm only going to be able to have one working power grid so that's an interesting interesting thing to think about yeah I could also re <laughs> replace the the vanilla workshop uh, to a newly created one and then it wouldn't uh, cause a power issue but uh, I I'm afraid it would cause a whole lot of other issues <laughs> to yeah just uh, delete or disable a vanilla workshop and replace it with a with a mod mod added uh, new reference right so, yeah, yeah, so that's probably it's probably one of those. It's there's always those little things that people have to be watching out for. It's and it's a shame because I personally one one of the things that drives me forward on my mods to continue to update them is I I always dream of the day when it's so well integrated that you can't tell where the mod starts and the game ends or vice versa. Mm, yeah. So where it just feels like it's completely part of it and there's no I don't like rough edges. I wanna I wanna get rid of them. I want it to feel just smoothly integrated. But there's always you always occasionally hit brick walls like that where there's no yeah. way to do. It. And by the way, I, I believe I'm, of course, I'm not sure about this, but I believe this is why uh, this power grid free feature got removed from the creation kit. So you can do it in Exedit, but uh, you okay. cannot, cannot uh, do a working power grid in the creation kit because uh, there is simply j just no feature for it. You can create wires, of course, you can connect uh, objects with uh, bendable splines as wires, but you cannot... Uh, edit uh, or create a new power grid on a workshop in the creation kit and the interesting there's there's a on the import menu there's an import power grid but we don't have any we have no idea how you're supposed to create the data for those yeah so when you go to import it it's like what does it need i don't know what that file is so i wonder if bethesda was even going into the game and building the power grids and then exporting the data to import into the creation kit maybe that's why that tool's there probably yeah but uh I don't think uh, it's a good idea to release mods like uh, these that uh, uh, edit the power grid of uh, vanilla workshops because uh, it it will only work if you never never unlock the workshop uh, uh, with your character or never build something right. power related at that uh, settlement site and uh, yeah. only a couple of uh, vanilla workshops have uh, pre-placed and preset uh, working power grids like the castle or or home plate uh, but of course this never this is never a problem with uh, with a vanilla workshop that has a power grid within fallout 4 esm but it right. can be a problem with the mod so that'll just be one of those constant tech support issues once you release this and people complain yeah, about power. i will suggest uh, yeah. once once this tool uh, gets released i will suggest uh, settlement builders uh, who use this tool to to release their builds uh, as as mods to always release two versions one with a power grid and one without so yeah those players that uh, already unlock those uh, settlements uh, would download the, the the version without the power sure sure and then it can be just a little mini game for people to go run around and wire the grid back up <laughs> In fact, oh, unfortunately, that, that's yeah. one of the things. Yeah, unfortunately, and I don't know how we would do. I think you could. So I found a a trick. I actually picked it up from. I found it in uh, uh, by reverse engineering amazing follower tweaks about if you you can modify the actor values for power generated and power required, mm -hmm. and you can force objects to self power, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And theoretically, you should be able to do that even on PlayStation. Is just. Uh, there's there's got to be some scripts that can do this. I, I don't know. It's always it's always a, a challenge with 
finding ways to manipulate the vanilla scripts that are available to pull this stuff off, but that would be the only way I could think you could do it correctly on those would be to set up some sort of script to grab grab all powered items, grab all powered objects somehow, and then apply this thing to them. I don't know. Or it might just have to be a separate mod where you manually go edit all of those items because you could easily edit the AVs on a, on a plugin. You can go make a mod that just sets all of them to have you know, power generated point one and power required point one and they'll all self power, but that would require vanilla editing all of those items. So then they wouldn't be able to work correctly. So you wouldn't be able to yeah, use cause normal power. Those, those needed to go on the base object, right? Uh, right. The, the base form of the, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, exactly. it's, it's, it's a good idea, of course. Yeah. But, but, uh, but, uh, then you could not uh, just, uh, remove the power from that uh, object by removing, removing a wire or something, but, uh, maybe, right, it's just maybe, powered. maybe it's a better solution than a, a completely unpowered settlement when, where you have to manually resnap or rewire everything. The problem yeah, is that can get pretty painful yeah. <laughs> to rewire everything, especially, and I was actually going to ask in your esp version so if the power can be pre-placed that means people will be able to share their completed uh, contraptions and things like that so thing you know the contraptions workshop all those complicated things you can do with that uh yes uh i only have That's problems very cool. i only have problems with uh, with uh, logic gates logic gates because okay. uh, those are the only objects in the game that have uh, more than one wire connect points and it's uh, not the same type of uh, connect point as uh, in all other meshes, but uh, it has an input. Uh, they have an input and an output. So is that going to be a problem you'll be able to solve ever, or is the game is the data just not available currently? Mm, it's going to be a problem that I can solve uh, with this new tool, uh, but uh, it's uh, harder to actually solve it uh, within transfer settlements, but because. Uh, with transfer settlements, that's a that's a bug that uh, never got uh, fixed yet, because uh, the way uh, these uh, power functions work in the script uh, extender, they expect uh, each of these uh, objects having only one connect point. So I I kind of needed to uh, if I if I ever wanted want to fix this, I somehow need to alter those uh, script extender functions that uh, are responsible for connecting objects. So they would gotcha. uh, also work with uh, logic gates. But with uh, with this new tool that converts a blueprint into an ESP, I, I think I, I may uh, be able to uh, fix this issue more easily. Uh, that would be so, yeah. that would be very cool because I've seen some pretty amazing machines people have built on YouTube. Oh, tell Obviously, me about they're... it! Yeah, the, there are some people who actually uh, built uh, working uh, processors in in Fallout Four, <laughs> <Yeah>. I believe. <laughs> yes, that's that's, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot like the the Redstone people who do all the crazy stuff with Minecraft. Mm -hmm. But uh, the it, it was cool to see in Fallout Four because it's a lot prettier to look at and see all those things. But there, a lot of people, I, I get asked that about city plans. If they can ask, they'll ask me if they can have support for those working machines. And there's just no way to do it without the script extender. Mm -hmm. But your tool, obviously, creating ESPs directly suddenly changes things a lot in that regard. Well, that's what'll be. That's nice to hear. What'll be interesting. <laughs> what'll be interesting is will it survive a disable? So I, that's one of the things Sim Settlements uses as its trick, is it just disables things to hide them and, and re-enables them. Is I'm wondering if if all of that information, all that power grid information and the logic gates and everything would stay alive through a disable enable. That would be really interesting to find out. I believe so, because um, uh, remember when we had that uh, power grid bug a few months ago that. Uh, Rash 2K actually solved. Yeah. That was about uh, missing or disabled uh, objects as That's well right, right within there. the power yeah. grid. And yeah. uh, the actual objects that uh, were also in the power grid and still uh, were a a enabled and, uh, and uh, present in the game uh, were still working and uh, were still having power. But uh, 
I don't think uh, that would be affected uh, if uh, one of the items within the power grid got deleted or disabled more likely. So I, I, yeah, that's I right. have to I, disable is safe. It's yeah. always delete. That was it's when they were deleted and left. In exactly. There, problem. Exactly. Right. I have yeah. to test uh, it in the future, but I think there's not going to be a problem with that. That is so cool. Yeah, that's going to be that's going to be a pretty big. I, I think that's one of those tools where it's, it's hard to state the impact, but I can vouch for this, that this is going to have a massive effect on the possibility for what people can do with mods. And it's also it's we've already got some ideas what we're going to do with it with some supplements to improve performance because that's one just having all of the data in the creation kit just makes it a lot easier to manipulate so things in the game there's a certain challenge to it and it also makes it for example with some supplements we have a ton a ton of bug reports for things from rise of the commonwealth and rise of the commonwealth's been out for like 14 15 months and we still have bugs we haven't dealt with, and they tend to be things like floating items or duplicated doors, mm -hmm. things like that. They just take so long for us to fix because we have to basically go into the game, go into each of our levels of saves, and tweak the positioning or delete the extra item, re-export them all with transfer settlements, and then rebuild our file and then merge it into the main. It's a, like to make one small change to a settlement could take four or five hours. So we don't do them. We tend to just like, we wait until we have a whole bunch that we're ready to tackle and we'll just do one settlement. So that's why for those of you listening who have wondered why we haven't fixed certain floating items in, in our city plans, it's because it takes a massive amount of time and it's also a risk. Like if we do it, if we do the merge incorrectly, then we just break the city plan for people. So we'd rather just leave the floating items than risk that. But a system like that, if we had all of those, in ESP form to work with, the tweak would be just as easy as making any other tweak in a mod. It could be it could take me minutes to fix these issues instead of hours. So um, I'm I'm very very excited for this tool. I think it's going to be it's going to be a huge boon for Sim Settlements. But then the fact that people will be able to take their designs and share them with PlayStation users is just unbelievably cool. And I would also love to see more people building uh, with less mods. Like I, I love I love mods that add items and stuff, but it makes it really hard to share. Your, sit, your designs when you have a bunch of stuff that requires extra downloads. You know, if people have to, this is one of the things, if you look at the Transfer Settlements Blueprint download counts, you can see they're relatively small yeah. per blueprint because most of the authors have designed them with, you know, 30 or 40 mods. Well, now you're asking players to not only download this blueprint, but you're asking them to download 30 or 40 mods, and that's just too much to ask most people. Yeah. So I think that the, a system like this will encourage more people to build with, with straight vanilla and DLC items. And I think you can do a lot with those, especially especially when you factor in the fact that even for PlayStation users, and this is one of those things that we did the Project Blueprint mods for. Now we broke free of it. At some In some cases we do have some number of non-vanilla items that we've created, but what I anticipate mm -hmm. doing at some point after you release this tool is re retooling a version of those Project Blueprint mods to where every single buildable item in a version of them is is available in the vanilla game so that they'll be available for PlayStation users. Because there are probably, I don't know, 40,000 items you could build with vanilla in the vanilla game that could be build that could be accessible by PlayStation users. So there's really no reason for people to need third-party mods to design with. The, the biggest benefit to them is the fact that they're more intricately designed like creative clutter where you've got a whole bunch of stuff that's already pre-placed but in reality between static collections and the fact that you can use mesh replacers to add snap points there's really no reason that people need to be building with mod items they could be building completely with vanilla available items altered in such a way that they would work well in in the workshop mode and then using your tool be shareable with all players so like the i don't know how many people use or play fallout 4 still but i from what i understand is that the playstation base is actually the majority mm -hmm. like they i think playstation out outnumbers uh, xbox and pc players combined is from what i from what i've understood and that's reading, why it's uh, said reports. that uh better than sony couldn't agree on these uh, external assets yeah I, i'm really curious why that is like I, I would like to think that it's not just sony being buttheads like that there's got to be some sort of technical reason or some sort of proprietary tech thing for like the only idea i've thought of that made sense to me was if sony's got some sort of proprietary technology mm -hmm. that you have to use to convert certain file types and they don't want the and you would have to and bethesda would have to share that 
plug in with all of us mod users in order to do that and that obviously that would be a big no-no that's the only thing i could come up with that would make them not seem like a-holes <laughs> because every <laughs> other reason seems like it would all be financially driven well i always so, uh, thought that uh, it's uh, some kind of security policy by sony's part but obviously i don't know the real reasons i just can guess right well anyway uh Back to the topic. I, I'm uh, I'm really glad that uh, you'll you'll be able to use this tool, and uh, it's gonna be useful for your team, and it really motivates me. Like I said, and uh, I also wanted to ask you, when you talk uh, about vanilla assets, uh, for example, for PS4 players, uh, are you including? Uh, creation club items as well or uh, DLC items or you are planning to make these optional uh, it would probably be optional so mm -hmm. we right now the way we have our the way we have our tools right now it's gonna require me to to rethink them because they're, they're heavily based on the fact that we can create our own versions of the NIFs and just include them mm -hmm. um, and obviously that doesn't work with PlayStation yeah. so. Uh, we'd have to we have to rethink some of that and I also the problem with our tools right now is they're very not user friendly like we don't have a ton of snap points we didn't really because this was all uh, this was a dev tool uh, or the way those were released which is why they aren't super public you have to download our toolkit and then you find them in there and it was done intentionally that way to because I, I you know when you download something like homemaker that's designed mm -hmm. for the average player and everything's got snap points it's all got collision yeah the other tool we did was generated by a script so it was we came up with so some people on our team like donald strong and tank thing and a couple others went through the creation kit and found all the cool objects and basically sent me a list and then i had a script to gen that could generate the building records and everything and do material swaps on the fly so it was it was it's mostly generated all from a script which is why why we're able to have like 10 or 15,000 items in there mm -hmm. so to do it correctly so that it would work for PlayStation we would need to do it more by hand and then once we're doing stuff by hand we could do alternate versions for each of the DLC and stuff uh-huh yeah speaking but yeah there's no reason that it, they shouldn't have access mm -hmm. to all that stuff yeah and even i imagine even your tool could be capable of offering options that say like do you want this to be vanilla only or do you of want course this to be uh yeah it's gonna have the same uh amount of options that uh transfer settlements have and then some sure. more and uh i'm also gonna add, add layers as well so that's uh oh, that's that's what we're waiting for we need those <laughs> layers <laughs> that's in fact i've got to get i got to get some work i gotta get some work done on workshop plus i've got uh some people have been mentioning there's a lot of bugs in it right uh -huh. now and the layer system is the big advantage that that mod has over something like copy pasta uh but speaking of ps4 uh, i also have to uh mention that uh there's another problem uh with this too because uh okay. Uh, obviously, when you mix something static uh, in your blueprint in your settlement build, for example, there's a weapon that you can uh, that you just wanna stick to your wall with tools like place everywhere or something like that. You just make it right. uh, static, and then uh, it gets exported as uh, static into the blueprint. And if you import it back with transfer settlements, it uh, will stay static uh, right uh, when you convert this blueprint into an ESP you have to make it static as well and I can uh, again attach a, a script which is vanilla this uh, default uh, remove havoc on load or something like that so it's gonna sure. be working on PS4 as well that's that's not a problem but there are some objects I call them complex objects like for example, Nuka Kate games from Nuka World DLC, or or the the eleva eleva elevators from I don't know which DLC it was uh, added with. Yeah. Which uh, just uh, have these comp I, I I call them complex objects because these uh, ha have these uh, small little parts, these small little extra parts that only appear if you call an event on them. If you call the on workshop object placed event on them 
Okay. And that event gets uh, obviously gets uh, automatically called when you place uh, manually the uh, place these items manually in in workshop mode. But uh, right. with with an ESP, if these items are pre-placed, you have to attach a script that calls these events on them on load. And that's possible with PC. That's possible with Xbox. But I haven't found a, a vanilla script that would do this for PS4 players. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. It's a shame that they don't have because all we would need, we would need some sort of vanilla script that had a call function in it. That, and that's it. it. And that's it. Set. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I mean, we need uh, we need Bethesda to put something like that, sneak something like that into one of their updates. <laughs> <laughs> if they that, was, that would be, yeah. if they that was one of my yeah. hopes with Creation Club that never seems to have manifested. I was hoping when they announced it that we would see Bethesda opening up more and more of Papyrus or putting in more uh, more default scripts that we could make use of for the sake of PlayStation users, but it never really happened, which is a bummer. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one can be uh, hopeful. <laughs> still. Yeah, we can, we can hope. there's still still plenty of time left. Like, we keep sen like we've uh, all been saying, I think, is we've got a lot more time with with Fallout 4 thanks to how long it's going to take for Bethesda to get their next single player game. And even then, even once that comes out, like say Starfield comes out, it's not necessarily going to be at attractive to the same audience that likes Fallout 4. There's a certain there's a certain aesthetic and feel to the Fallout games that it's hard to get anywhere else. Exactly. I mean, I like I love Elder Scrolls, but it does not scratch the same itch that Fallout does. Exactly, exactly. And uh, and especially with uh, with uh, Fallout seventy six uh, around and uh, being a game as a service, uh, I'm I'm sorry to say, but uh, I don't expect a Fallout five uh, within the next seven eight years. That's crazy. That's so wild. It's so funny to think. I mean, I actually think it's a good thing, but it's a weird thing to think about when you look at other big franchises that get almost annual releases and then it's yeah. like we've got this beloved franchise and it's almost once a decade you get a new one which is just weird yeah. but I, I think I, I really think Bethesda has has the right idea with that is that with that amount of time between the games by the time the next one comes out like you are longing for it like I by the time if it's seven years till Fallout 5 like I'm gonna lose my mind when they announce Fallout 5 because it's just gonna have been so long since I will have had a fresh new fallout experience that's the same thing with elder scrolls elder scrolls 6 it's going to have been so long since skyrim came out that it's just going to be like yes that's true that's true but uh there's a point when uh, you cannot uh, live up to the hype that's true that's true because uh, for example i don't know if uh for example if half-life 3 came out ev uh, comes out ever it would be a, <laughs> it, it would be a good enough uh game with all the hype around it so that's uh, that's uh, that was uh, kind of true to uh, Fallout Four as well, and uh, I'm I'm uh, a bit uh, afraid for for the other Scroll Six for this regard. Yeah, yeah, it'll be. I don't know. Uh, well, we're getting to a point where things are kind of becoming standardized in the industry as far as like expectations about yeah. what goes into a game, and I think that part of the part of the issue there that makes it difficult from a game developer standpoint is just the number of features they have that you're just expected to have by default. That stuff doesn't just build itself. It all has to ha be, you have to put the time in. So almost part of the delay between the games is just due to the expectations in the industry of how much basic stuff you have to have. Yes, yes. So the problem. Uh, I, I also see that's why they do things like EA with the Frostbite engine, where they're just trying to get all that stuff that's standard in games now to just be like done ahead of time. Like you don't have to reinvent this wheel. But I, I still see them having, and that's probably why like the creation engine. You know, we still see features held over from Morrowind is because they don't have the time or resources to continue to reinvent the wheel every time, every new release. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's probably uh, uh, the problem was that the Frostbite engine wasn't uh, the perfect for Anthem. Uh, not unlike uh, the creation engine for Fallout 76. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I, I can definitely see after having spent so much time in the creation engine and now that I know the workflow so well, I, the idea of having to relearn all that. I mean, it's I'm on my... So, so I've modded in the creation engine before and... Uh, but never to the extent I have now. I'm now on, 
let's see, almost year three of modding heavily where I'm you mm-hmm. know, touching that thing every day. And I'm still finding new stuff all the time and getting better at things. So it's it's a year. I mean, it's it's just like learning to program or any other skill. It's like learning your way through a tool like that can take years to master. That's true. And so having to, having to redo that would be be pretty scary especially if you had to do it at a company-wide level it's like all right guys you've gotten real fast at making games now for our next one you're gonna have to learn a whole new tool and and throw everything you know, out that you know from before that's that's kind of uh, intimidating when you've got the the time like you've got that ticking time bomb of uh, you run out of funds for your company yeah uh, don't uh, get me wrong i'm not saying they shouldn't use the creation creation engine i'm saying they should uh, create single player games <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I agree. <laughs> and it's 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 very true. Back, back to the single player game. Please. It's very true. I'm still uh, I'm still uh, finding uh, new stuff uh, every day or almost every day, too. And uh, you know what's my uh, one of the, my favorite things to do? Just uh, going through my uh, I, I created a list of uh, all the Papyrus functions. Basically, uh, I exported the Creation Kit uh, wiki into into this. Uh, uh, this excel sheet and just going through and just going through the names of the functions and uh, that alone uh, gives me new ideas for mods yeah Uh, for example (laughs) there's a function uh, that's called uh, push actor away so that gave me an idea uh, two years ago obviously oh yeah push away companions amazing mod that's uh that's actually that's one of those ones on my that one and quick trade are two on my list of all right we need a new framework yeah. we need a we need an activation wheel framework yeah so yeah, that we yeah. can uh inject inject things like that so that we can have as many of those as we want because i want all of those mods every mm-hmm. time somebody puts out like there's uh push away companions quick trade what's my name um i have an idea for one that i won't talk about for the reasons we've mentioned before if i don't want to get stuck to having to do it but there's just so many things you want to be able to do and the game has a limitation of you can only natively do two activation options without introducing modifiers so it's uh it's kind of limiting yeah the best i could do is to uh, create patches for the most popular ones like for example for quick trade i have a patch so the two mods can work together yeah yeah, it would be it would be nice if we just got a little little weapon wheel style thing that came up to let you choose which option you wanted to do yeah. on them, yeah. and that way push away companions could always be the first one because that's the <laughs> most important one. <laughs> well, got to launch Preston once in a while to feel good. Sometimes it's a more it's it's probably the most important one. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I the my favorite when I first saw that mod, it was somebody put up a video on YouTube where they were just launching all of the Minutemen off of the roof before they the off of uh what's the building where you launch the nuke from at the end of the game you know i'm talking about that giant tower up there yeah you just send uh, them flying over the edge <laughs> yeah 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 you can also modify the the push force as well oh that's yeah great. it's fun yeah some of the there's there's so many great functions and stuff you can do that. I, i've done the same thing i've started whenever i come up with a or come across a function i haven't seen before i i jot it down for research and try and play around with it and see what it'll do and i have just pages of, of mod ideas that probably are never going to see the light of day but they could if i had unlimited time and yeah there's so much that can be done there's also i think there's a ton that hasn't been touched yet there's still a ton of a fallout 4 that could be expanded on which is oh it's shocking to me like the game's been out for what two and a half three and a half, three and a half years was it 2015 it's 2019 now so three and a half years and there's still a ton of things I don't think have been I don't think the surface has been even scratched on. About yeah, for doing. example, I I, um, I really want to dig myself into random encounters. Oh, random encounters are cool. Yeah. I and there's a lot. There's all yeah. There's hardly anything that gets done with that either. It's yeah. seen, and I don't know if it's just that people don't. There's a lot. There's it's a very complex thing to do because you have to interact with the story manager. You've got to set up. You've got to set up scripting. There's a lot that goes into those. It's not it's probably as best as just if you stuff into yeah, the game. yeah. It's probably best if you create your or uh, your co- uh, completely separate uh, story branch and uh, don't touch anything vanilla. It's, right. pro- it's probably best if you if you uh, take the example how uh, the DLC 
for example, the Far, Far Harbor DLC or, or Nuka World DLC uh, adds a, a lot of uh, new random encounters w without uh, breaking the vanilla story manager. Yeah. So it's probably the best to look uh, uh, at those. But um, I also wanted to create a system that uh, that would uh, interrupt your fast travel. So if you choose the fast travel from point A to point B, uh, there would be a chance uh, that your travel would be uh, interrupted. Oh, uh, like yeah, that's how the old how, Fallout games yeah, used to work. Exactly. That's how random encounters used to be. Yeah, that was yeah, really cool. Halfway through, and uh, it would spawn a random encounter there, and it would uh, create uh, this uh, huge globe around you, like uh, uh, the size of a, a single cell or something. Okay. So, so you would uh, feel like... Uh, being in a completely separate uh, or segregated uh, cell that is uh, just for that random encounter and uh, once the <laughs> encounter is uh, finished uh, that uh, globe around you would uh, dissipate and uh, and then you could uh, found, find out that oh here i am because uh, you you would see the rest of the game world and uh, then you could uh, choose to continue your travel or or just uh, explore the the location, because uh, I, I one... that sounds fantastic. I loved the because I loved the fast travel in those old games because it didn't feel as cheaty, knowing that there was that opportunity to mm -hmm. get yeah. ambushed. And some of them, some exactly. of those random encounters in the original games were deadly, like they were real yeah. nasty. So fast traveling was a risk. Yeah, exactly. So I wanted to add that, and I also wanted to create a framework. Uh, that maybe could uh, make uh, other mothers uh, uh, make it uh, easy uh, easier to to add new uh, or custom additional random encounter uh, packages or i also wanted to recreate some of the old ones like uh, these really silly ones from the first two fallout games like with the one with the tardis or things like that <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of things to do with random encounters and fast travel, and that's that's uh, one of the the aspects of the game I I want to uh, I definitely want to explore in the future. Because one of my problems uh, with fast travel, and that's that's uh, that that I I found out uh, this uh, by playing the game in survival, is that if you constantly fast travel, you you miss out uh, most of the game world, really. Because yeah. You always go from point A to point B, and there will be uh, places you 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 never never encountered, even if you right. played the game for two thousand hours. <laughs> yeah, one, I mean, one of the pro one of the problems I find when I play without fast travel is that the game's really designed for fast travel. So things yeah, like like yeah. sims like sim settlements does not work well with with uh, a non-fast travel play or the attack system settlement attack system built into the vanilla that's game true does not true. work well with that idea of not having fast travel and yeah I, I, I you almost have to design the game with that up front i think in order to make it really play well where it feels good so i'm not opposed i i always use fast travel just because of that but like you said there's tons of stuff you'll just never ever see which is unfortunate and i don't know how you fix how do you how do you solve that problem how do you allow some of the locations you've already been to to still matter in the game and still yeah i don't know that's a tough it's a tough balancing act yeah yeah i see your point and uh i also uh in survival i tend to use uh vertibert fast travel a lot especially right. uh when uh when uh, settlement attacks occur because uh, yeah otherwise it would be just insane to backtrack <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, ver the the vertebrate system always that's what i had always hoped it would be it would be like um uh you use that to get around when you need when you need that when you need to run back and do something and that the vertebrate would be a real very realistic option and you could avoid actual fast travel it would literally just be you're moving physically fast because you're up in the air and yeah. you can avoid the encounters and everything but it takes so long to get that unlocked that generally by the time i get there i've already I've already given up on the idea of no fast travel because it just takes too long into the game. I don't know what the appropriate place would be in the game to introduce fast travel, but to me it seems to be, it needs to be sooner than that. Yeah, yeah. I could also think of uh, another solution, maybe. Okay. 
you put a travel package on the player, you remove uh, player controls, and you triple or, or quadruple the, the global time multiplier. Okay. And uh, you just watch uh, your character in, in third person uh, quickly moving uh, through that, uh, that route. That would uh, <laughs> be really otherwise involved uh, when you uh, either fast travel or, or use a vertibird. But uh, yeah. if you if your character gets attacked or, or some something something is happening uh, around uh, your character, for example, you unlock uh, you trigger a, a random encounter or like I said, uh, some enemies are attacking you, then uh, yeah. the game uh, would just go back to normal and uh, normal speed, and you get back uh, player controls. Control, yeah. That, that sounds very cool. See, look at all these mods you're coming up with. Dude. No wonder you're you're, ne you're never gonna finish anything. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, I should, I, 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 yeah, uh, I speak too much. I shouldn't mention these. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that sounds really cool, uh, and it does sound like it might solve uh, one of those problems with with the the way the game is designed, and then when you combine it with something like survival, because the idea of survival, the idea of survival always appeals to me way more than the actual gameplay of it. Is that I it, it doesn't work well with the amount of time I have available to game, the idea of taking away fast travel. But I do like the idea of spending more time, enjoying the world, and slowly going through it, and, and you know prepare it, having my character prepare each time. But then when reality sets in, and it's like, all right, all of that stuff, it's it's funny because that stuff is very tedious and slow. But that's what allows those big moments to be more exciting because you spent some time. In a in a little more relaxed state, doing that tedious stuff, and then so then the payoff becomes better. But if you only have you know a few hours a week to game, well then you're only gonna see those the fun moments every every couple of weeks instead of every play session, and so it uh, yeah it's yeah 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 it's too much. And so yeah, the, the gaming the game pacing is designed for people like when you're playing like that in survival. I feel like that pacing is designed well for people who have a lot of hours to put into the game. But for anybody who's short on time, it just doesn't work, unfortunately. Which is, again, unfortunately, because it, it seems like it, I can see the payoff and I can see the, the potential joy in it. But something like what you just suggested might be a good solution to allow people to enjoy that gameplay without having to sacrifice, or even with if they've got limited time to play, knowing that they still have a, a variant of fast travel that uh, that's allows them to do some of those gameplay things. They like run back to their settlements and defend things or, or play a mod like some settlements and, and then still play with the little, with the hardcoreness of no actual fast travel. I especially want to see your random encounter globe thing. That sounds so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is the point when I usually stop uh, the project I'm working currently <laughs> and start working. Right, right. <laughs> but I, yeah, will, I, that's... I won't do that now. <laughs> That's that's a tough urge to resist. I I yeah. personally am, I'm I'm kind of bad at it, but I I always keep the project I have going. It just might mm -hmm. be that it gets less attention, obviously. Because so you like, already know that, example, uh, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, like for example, I released Workshop Plus, and I had a big uh -huh. bunch of plans for it, and those kind of got put on hold because we started moving forward with Conqueror. So it's yeah, it's hard to it's hard to resist those things. But you've got to, I mean, this is this is part of the battle with being a creator. I think even. I would say it's because we're not getting paid, but I don't think that's it. I think even anybody who's getting paid to create, you still need to have things that motivate you. If you're not yeah. excited to get up every morning and work on something, you're not going to do a good, as good a job as if you as if you were pumped up. That's very it. true, yeah. And you already know with your ongoing project that you can do this, but the, there are those additional weeks when you just have to finish everything, do the mod page, add features, and that's right. uh, less exciting than start uh, working on something that you don't know yet that you can pull off. And uh, but uh, I think uh, it was uh, in your podcast with uh, Fading Signal, uh, I guess, uh, when uh, one of you mentioned that uh, a finished project is 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 uh, always more valuable than a perfect project. Right. I think absolutely. And yeah, uh, I think I've talked about that with all, with several people because it's such an yeah. important concept of if you never release anything, it doesn't matter what you're working on. If yeah, it's, and exactly. Unless, unless your goal is just exercising. If you're just trying to <laughs> flex your brain, obviously the release doesn't matter. But if your goal is to create art that other people can experience, you have to it, just release sometimes, exactly. which requires finishing things. <laughs> so I try to keep that in mind 
and not feature creeping everything. <laughs> oh, I love I love feature creeping. Uh, one of the, one of the things one of the disciplines I, I've set for myself recently that has been working well is um, I set myself a two week schedule and in it I have time blocked away for everything. So I have time blocked for each of my existing projects and I have some time blocked for just experimenting. And that way I know that at least a couple times a month I'm gonna get to scratch each of those itches and still give people the features they want. Like for example, tonight I have planned like explicitly all I'm gonna do all night is work on bug fixes. So there's mm -hmm. so that way some of my older stuff gets an update. And then, you know, it'll be a couple weeks before I go back and do that again. Obviously any I'm I'm not talking about emergency issues like game breaking things, but mm -hmm. you know, those like little nu nuisancey bugs where I know it's going to take me hours to investigate the, the stuff that's really obnoxious to the, as a developer and players, you know, just learn to live with it. And I don't yeah. want them to learn to live with it, but those things I feel like I want to tackle once in a while and I can't, but if I did that every day, I would burn out and stop modding <laughs> like real fast. So, yeah, it's uh, hard to find the motivation for something like that, but, uh, a few weeks ago or maybe a few months ago uh, I for example cleaned out uh, all the small issues uh, of transfer settlements it, and it was such a good feeling to see the bug section uh, with zero bugs oh, <laughs> finally I've never had that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah never had that in my life you can find the motivation for bug fixing as well but it's not easy yeah well, one of the uh, another change I, I made recently to try and help with that is uh, we no longer have public bugs bug report sections now. Everything is just a help section, mm -hmm. and once someone verifies that it's a bug, it goes in our bug section because it was it was basically like swatting. It was like playing whack a mole to try and keep the bugs at bay because most of them weren't actually bugs; they were just people you know having bad load orders or whatever. So it it would get to the point where I would get it down to. I remember at one point I had some settlements down to six bug reports. And then I release a patch and then it jumps back up to like 40 and mm -hmm. most of them weren't actual bugs. And it was just mind numbing to do that over and over again. Yeah. That's so I finally like, thing. had to, had to kill it. It was like, I can't, I can't do it. Anymore. I'm never going to get to zero if, if everyone can keep adding stuff to it. Yeah. That's the other that's thing. Uh, I, uh, what I try to do is to respond, uh, immediately to something that is not, uh, an actual bug and, uh, you know, I don't want to close it without responding, obviously. So, yeah. I, I, it's, a, I, it's a tough line to walk there because sometimes, yeah. you you know, you read the report and it's like, there's no way my software is causing it. And then it turns out it is. You know what I mean? Like, I've had plenty where I'm like, I objectively say, there's no way my code could possibly do that. And then I get enough of reports of it. I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe. And then it just happens to be you know, something that was just tangential, tangentially related that I had no idea I was touching and it turned out to, it was mine or, um, you know, maybe it wasn't directly mine, but because of something else I'm doing, it causes some other mod to cause a problem. And, uh, so it's really hard for me to even reject, like to, to outright reject most reports. I almost have to give them all merit, which is why mm -hmm. I had to just be like, yeah, so, so it eventually just got to the point where if that's the case, then I'm never, ever going to get to zero. And that's, sad. yeah. I'm I'm talking more like uh, issues like uh, where it's obvious that uh, the user didn't uh, install uh, Fallout 4 script extender or Hoot framework correctly. So there are always right. these uh, returning bug, bug reports that are not actual bugs, but uh, but uh, problems with the install steps. So I'm, sure. I, I was talking more uh, issues like that. Yeah, yeah, those are constant. The the yeah. user issues of of and it's and it's a tough thing. This is uh, this is another thing we, I was talking about with fading was the the mod pack thing. There's since Xbox got mods, I feel like the number of people and this has always been a thing in, in modding, but I I in my in my estimation it has grown a lot since then. Is the number of novice users showing up to mm -hmm. mod has grown substantially, and it's modding is complicated and it takes a while to get to get decent at it. Even yeah. as a player, not, I'm not even talking about modding as in making mods, but just as a player. And so those returning reports, I, I always think I always see those as a positive, not necessarily. There's a, there's a, a lot of people who would say, you know, uh, RTFM, read the effing manual. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I can get that to some extent. But on the other on the other side of things is I am a software developer and I know that and, and in the web development world we kind of always are trained to design things that any idiot can use. And you know, you yeah. understand why is that if you present a website to somebody that you're is a 
potential customer to you and it's difficult to use, they're going to walk away because they're not invested enough yet to learn it. So I almost feel I, I almost feel like we shouldn't expect anybody to read a damn thing and they should just be able to figure it all out. And so uh, with modding, it's not really possible right now. There are certain things like this. Well, there's a big uh, difference in my, my opinion. <laughs> and that's... Okay. Uh, that you don't uh, get paid for modding. Of true. course, you, you get true. get donations, but it's not like a, a paid service that you are uh, providing. But yeah, right. uh, I I, uh, I absolutely agree. It can be annoying that uh, there are always users who are new to modding, but uh, then again, it's a good thing that are uh, that that uh, there are uh, always new users and uh, always new people who get into. Skyrim or Fallout 4 or modding in general. So yeah, it's good to have new people. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's just it's just tough to get past some of those hurdles. The yeah. script extender is one. Even HUD framework is one of just explaining to people about you know installing the correct mods and everything. One of the things that's nice is that um, when the parent mod is missing, it seems that Fallout 4 itself kind of warns the user that they that they don't have the right things installed. Yeah, if it's a so uh, dependency on a, a plugin level, then then yeah, yeah, absolutely. That can help with that, but it doesn't seem to all. It doesn't seem to always work. I don't know if this is an Xbox thing, but I, I get a comment. So we have uh, requirements of Sim Settlements and Workshop Framework on Conqueror, and for some reason, people are able to try Conqueror without Workshop Framework, even though it has as a parent. So I don't know if maybe, I don't know if maybe that's a limitation with uh, with Xbox's detection of it or something. I don't know, but sometimes it. It does seem to allow them to even get past that, but that was a good. That was a cool feature to try and help with mm -hmm. user issues. If they try and launch the game with a mod and it's missing a parent, the game just literally tells them right from them, "Hey, you're missing this," mm -hmm. to make it easier for people to understand they need to go fix fix the problem. So, Bethesda is definitely, despite anything negative people have to say about them, they they are very supportive of the mod community because they are they are doing things like that, like to make modding easier, which is in turn helping us as mod authors not have to deal with as many silly support issues. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, well, with uh, transfer settlements, I try to do uh, my best because uh, I I try to figure out what is missing. I try to uh, pop up messages for the user. I even check if uh, some, uh, some uh, papyrus uh, scripts uh, are missing that... Uh, uh, that uh, that are needed to uh, uh, inst uh, be installed with uh, the script extender. Uh, so I try to uh, check everything and and uh, report the issue for the user in a pop up message if uh, something yeah. went wrong. But uh, of course, uh, you cannot prepare for all the possible situations. <laughs> right. Well, and your tool is com is complex enough, and it's just in its idea that if the player is not willing to do a little bit of reading on their own, they're probably not the right person for that anyway. Uh, well, like it's, that's yours why is a, I, yours is a tool tool more than a mod. Yeah, and it's a wall of text to read everything, and I I can uh, <laughs> I can understand if uh, someone doesn't want to do that, and that's why I value uh, YouTubers like Gopher or or Oxhorn or or uh, gamer pots who who make these uh, very valuable tutorials not just for in general how to mod your game but also they make tutorials for for example mods like sim settlements or transfer settlements and uh, I really like those content and and I always uh, link their videos in my mod pages for that reason yeah, that stuff's really nice. Just the video video tutorials to walk people through stuff is, I, I don't know, I, I've gotten, it's, it's funny, I, I tend to do everything I release in video form first. So I'll, I'll do tutorials or of how to use the mod, how to even make them. I, the one thing I haven't done is how to make some settlement stuff in tutorial. Mm -hmm. That's something that's on my agenda to do video tutorials for that. But I, it tends to be the people people prefer the video. And I don't know why it is, because in general, it seems like it would be a lot faster to just read through it, because then you yeah. can skim past the stuff you don't know. but. People seem to just prefer the video stuff, and it's uh, uh, maybe it's less intimidating that way because it's happening in real time right in front of you. You don't have to worry about keeping your attention. Well, I don't <laughs> know if, if if some somebody explains to you, it's probably uh, easier to understand. 
uh, than if you read it yourself. I don't know why uh, I prefer video format uh, uh, as well, not that I don't uh, read the disc description, but uh, if there's a video that uh, contains the same info, then I probably click on the video then, then read the whole thing. Because, I don't know, it's more in entertaining if somebody explains it to me, uh, somehow I, I, I catch up more quickly. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to say that uh, I really like uh, the way you are doing it, and uh, it's it's uh, it looks to me at least it looks like a really hard work that you put up uh, put up uh, so many videos and and uh, a video for each of your uh, updates for Sim Settlements, and uh, you have a. Uh, this podcast series you have a you have a, a playthrough you have a, a <laughs> weekly series like uh, uh, this uh, modding news so it's really something i i want to learn from you and i just uh, haven't figured out how to find the time for this and obviously i i have a, a handicap of not being a native speaker so sure Putting well, you know what? You get real. You get real good at English real fast if you have to do a two-hour podcast every week. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah, but uh, I always have to have to prepare a script uh, if I uh, do a video like that. For example, a tutorial for a mod. Sure. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a lot of work and takes up a lot of time. It's actually uh, I've been fortunate lately the last few months is that uh, Ricardo Estate, a friend of mine who had been streaming some settlements came on and hand, it was handling all the video editing. He unfortunately is, mm -hmm. uh, he just is leaving that responsibility very soon. Like he's gonna, he's got a couple more videos in production and then it's gonna be back on my shoulders again. So we'll see how it goes after that, if I can still make the time because it's mm -hmm. it's a lot of time. I mean, it, it would takes, it can take like for forever length of a video, it might take double that time to edit it and get it up and running. Now, less the case for these podcasts, it's down to a science. It's essentially, you know, we've, we've got to just take a few minutes to line up the uh, audio files and the video file of the icons. It's not a big deal. And so most of the time is actually just in recording it. But um, something like those Let's Play, like those can take many hours to assemble. So I don't know if, I don't know how long that can continue and me able to produce all the mod content. So I, I know exactly why most people don't do put out this much YouTube content. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hate editing. Almost as much as uh, doing mod pages. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, I guess you will have to find another editor then, because having an editor is a huge, huge help in this case. Oh yeah. Well, it's it's nice to be able to to just focus on certain things. So yeah. like I you know I I have all these different mods I want to focus on, and like if I just have to focus on getting information out, and it's just a matter of you know opening up the game and hit and record it's it's a it doesn't take much of my focus i don't have to think or plan about uh, uh about all the actual work that goes into the editing after the fact and and i can just kind of stay on target and keep moving but once you add in the editing and there's variables of what can come up with that and uh you know watch it through the same footage over and over again it can get it can get pretty pretty difficult to keep doing that week after week yeah so the uh having the division of labor with an editor is, is a huge boon but that's also it's it's one. This is one of the challenges in in modding in general is because there's no there's there's almost no money involved in, as far as like we can't you know we can't really make much money doing this. Is getting help with the the tedious tasks becomes a big challenge as well. A lot of that stuff like I I tend to find that the most tedious tasks that we have to do in the mod I just try to I try and take care of those myself because I don't feel right asking other people to do the uninteresting work. So. There's a lot of, um, and I, I'm sure you know about this, is like when you get down to that, where your mod is at 80% complete and you've got that last little bits to do to get yeah. things out. It's real simple stuff, but it's also really boring. And uh, that's that's how things like video editing kind of fall into, is that it's, it's that last little bit that's necessary to get things out there. And they kind of suck, but somebody's got to do it. And because we don't have money to be paying people to help with this, because we're not making any money, we just got to do that stuff ourselves. Yeah, and also if you if you have to pay for voice actors, for example, you you want to create a a new companion, and uh, you have everything uh, for it, but uh, <clears throat> it involves like I don't know, twelve hundred dialogue lines. How do you pay right. for it? Or how do you yeah. expect a voice actor to to record twelve hundred dialogue lines for you for free? So right. yeah. Well, 
yeah i mean it's a it's a tall order on that regard but i think i think there are enough people in the community who do that stuff anyway like voice acting in particular i think there are a lot of people who want to do that because they love the games and they want to see themselves in it other people do it to build up a demo reel but yeah even just asking people to do it it feels like oh, this is a lot to ask but hey <laughs> exactly would you be interested in doing this yeah and and i guess i one of the ways i don't feel as bad about it is the fact that i'm putting in you know way more time than it will take somebody to do something like that i don't know about you but it takes me a lot of hours every week to to produce mods like this it's uh yeah yeah same here <laughs> <laughs> especially because it's hard to know what's going to work and what's not it's hard to plan out you know it's not like for if you're planning out a programming project like you're laying out a website or you're designing something in, in c sharp or something you know how the how the languages work you know approximately what's going to work and the amount of labor that's going to go into it when you're doing something like modding you you have an idea of what might be possible but inevitably you're going to run into some brick wall that you had never anticipated and then you have to spend a lot of time kind of working your way around it because there are certain aspects of the game engine we can't control so yeah you, exactly so modding modding team for, for me at least seems to be one of the more time consuming types of creation i've ever been involved in yeah yeah same here and uh, you can cannot be sure of course uh, you ha uh, you can have a good idea what can be done and what cannot be done and like 95 percent of the time uh, yeah, that's true but uh, you can always uh, bump into something like you said well, especially when you're learning and this is something like yeah. anybody new out there who is learning to mod like that's going to be the first thing you you pick up is the fact that uh there are there are many things that won't be possible now and you're going to run into them and then if you just keep trying eventually you'll find a way around them but it just requires a lot of time investment you just got to keep kind of kind of skirting around the issue and try and find new clever ways to do things and eventually you can get there and then you get to the point where you're describing where you're at 95 percent of anything you come up with you know exactly the path you've got to take to get there yeah a good example for that is uh my player voice fre frequency slider mod that i eventually uh that i in initially released as a as a simple mod because there is a papyrus function that can uh change the frequency of uh for uh for voice types so yeah. you, you just change the frequency of the player voice type and uh that's it and then uh, it turned out that uh, this function only works uh, in a game se session uh, uh, before the first slow time effect. And after a slow time effect, that uh, function just uh, doesn't work in the, that, uh, that single game <laughs> session anymore. So I had to modify completely the whole, whole mod and uh, had to involve uh, the script extender. And uh, I, I believe it was... Uh, version 1.2 when when i when i had to make the mod rely on the script extender so there are always uh, these these uh, things that uh, you think it uh, would work and then uh, after a couple of hundred uh, players starts to use that mod uh, uh, there are these little things that uh, can simply uh, turn yeah. out yeah yeah i mean that to me that's why I, it's it's no I, I i understand completely why the game industry has embraced this early access model is because mm -hmm. there's no testing you can do internally that will match even close to what a million players can do in a couple of days <laughs> as far as yes. finding problems and stuff to help you just get through the testing phase easily like there are tons of things i mean this is why this is one of the reasons why i don't um ignore any bug report even though i mean we've shut down public access to the bug report section as far as posting but we, i still want uh, to take people's reports seriously is that there's like i can test as much as i want but i'm never going to be able to replicate a dedicated player's attempts to do things and like because when they're when when you're on the player side you're taking it seriously and you're trying to you know play your character a certain way and you're going to run into things differently than you know us when we know exactly the steps you're supposed to take so we just do those steps whereas they're going to just try and intuit their way through it and they're going to find so many more more things than we will absolutely and i mean uh there was a time when i only tested uh, my mods myself and there's a huge huge difference between uh testing my mod myself and having a small uh testing team now but uh, there's again a huge, 
huge difference uh, between having a small test team and then uh, having your mod tested uh, by thousands of people. Yeah, that's it's actually it's actually a lot of fun. I I love the the first you know first couple of weeks after a new release when you get to find all those little issues. It's I mean it's not fun in the sense of like <laughs> hey you released something that's kind of broken, uh, but it's fun to see all of those rough edges appear so that I can so that I can shave them down and, and get the product a little closer to perfect because yeah uh, the first couple of weeks I, are I, always uh, busy yeah oh, yeah they're very like the the I, I think I'm this I think you and I are the same in the our distaste for building mod pages because I just want to get the mod out usually by the time I'm at the point where it's time to build a mod page I'm like all right I just need I want this out I want people to play with it I want people to tell me what's wrong with it let's, let's get it out there yeah yeah I mean, I try to uh, stylize it a bit, and then try to come out uh, with well, come up come up with uh, a logo logo for each uh, of my new mods or things like that. But uh, that is exactly why I also hate it because I I just want uh, the the mod uh, to be out and released. Yeah. Well, yeah, that that's it's it's fun to find out what's wrong with them. I'm I'm a bit of a of a perfectionist like that in the the trying to find all the problems with my software. People might not believe that when I say it because there's so many there's so many bugs that pop up in something like that. But it's it, I'm constantly trying to iterate over and improve anything I've created, and that, so like any even any of my mods that have been untouched in a long time, it's always they never leave my my to do list. My to do list just is constant in flux in size so you know we talked about our idea books I, I also have my my uh one my let's fix this list which has stuff from the earliest days of my creations because i want to get all that stuff into perfect form it's just something about i've got my name on it and i know it can be perfected just with the enough with enough uh, mm -hmm. elbow grease thrown in there um, so I always want to want to pursue that perfection are you are you in that same boat do you do you enjoy getting your stuff perfectly flawless yeah, and uh, I also uh, see uh, how much I, I learned uh, since, uh, for example, some of my earlier uh, projects and earlier mods. Uh, and uh, right now I'm trying to go back to some of the, the older mods that I uh, published back in, for example, 2016. And... Uh, try to revamp them them uh, with uh, with the knowledge I gained uh, ever since for example one of my most uh, popular mods or even I think my mo most popular is uh, visible company and affinity and I, I want to absolutely revamp that mod with uh, with some new UI features and things like that sure and there are a lot of uh, of course there are there are a lot of papyrus stuff there that uh, that can be can be uh, implemented way better which i now see oh man yeah oh, yeah it's it's tough looking through some of some old code sometimes when it's like oh how did i yeah. how did i think that was a good idea uh, exactly. but yeah especially when you do it in in context of the you just didn't know exactly. there's a lot of stuff you just yeah. figure out later and think like oh i could do that a million times better now yeah, yeah. yeah. speaking of hey, uh, you, yeah i was gonna say has that happened at all with transfer settlements because that that mod is got to be pretty it, the code base of that's got to be pretty complex it's got a it's got a good amount of things in the ck and in papyrus it's got stuff in f4se there's a lot of moving parts going on there do you, have you looked back through that over time and found that there are a lot of reiterations and, and things you could do to improve that um, I, I try to constantly improve upon the code. There are things that uh, can be implemented uh, or there are things that I found out that can be implemented uh, much more effectively and those are the things that I, I usually fix. And uh, there are things that are just simply not so pretty in the code and those are the things that I... I uh, I don't uh, usually ha uh, find the time to to fix. You know, just uh, there are a lot of uh, commented outlines in the code and things like that mm -hmm. that I I could fix uh, at some point and make the the actual uh, 
papyrus file smaller by that. Sure. But uh, yeah, I'm trying to uh, constantly uh, improve upon the code. And uh, not just the papyrus, but uh, the C++ side of the code as well. Yeah. One, one of the things I found with, well, at least with some settlements, is that uh, in order, one of the problems I have is in order to maintain backward compatibility with existing saves and stuff, there are limitations about what I can actually fix. Yeah. And that it almost requires everybody like I've seen a lot of mods do this where they'll, they'll hit a major version and be like, make sure you, you know, uninstall the previous version or start a new save. And I try to never, ever do that. But, uh, there are, there are some points where it's like, all right, well, this is, this feature is effectively garbage <laughs> unless I rebuild from scratch and force players to start a new save. So I've been avoiding that, but I, I assume that that's less of an issue with transfer settlements because, for them, I mean, I guess you, there are probably some ways you could make the blueprints themselves more efficient, but then it might make it so that they aren't compatible. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, well, I'm I'm always trying to be uh, backward compatible compatible with with older versions of uh, transfer settlements and older versions of uh, especially blueprints because uh, when I when I trace a blueprint, for example, I always have to. Keep in mind that uh, there were those old blueprints that, for example, uh, didn't have this field or that field. So right. I always have to uh, prepare the the code implementation for those kind of thi uh, things. And uh, did you have yeah versioning in them from the beginning so that you could detect very easily yeah which yeah. what uh, code base they're from? Well, that's that's lucky. Yeah, yeah. The blueprint. I did not do that with I did not do that with add-on packs, unfortunately. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff I I can't I have to just I can't even assume because I have no idea which generation of code they were from. Yeah, the blueprint header had that uh, version information from the beginning. See this this guy's is why C Dante is better than I am at coding. <laughs> he thinks of these things ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, especially when I uh, when I do all my uh, pop-up messages with debug debug message boxes instead of uh, actual messages. So yeah. there are a lot of ugly things in the code and uh, by ugly things I I uh, I meant uh, these type of things uh, which is Practically doesn't really matter on PC, and uh, the mod is only exa uh, existing on PC. But uh, yeah, there are some things like this. I could put all the messages into proper message forms instead of uh, uh, debug message boxes and and things like that. So yeah, sure. But I'm trying to constantly improve upon it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm very excited about your upcoming project with the conversion over, and I'm glad glad to hear you're you've got plenty of more plenty more ideas for more mods. Uh, it's awesome that you also go like to go back and reiterate over your stuff. It's it's rare because so many people who mod this game or mod any of these games tend to release their stuff into the wild. They'll fix the nastiest bugs and then they walk away. Um, and so it's good to see that uh, you are of like mind with me that you want to keep supporting your stuff and keep iterating on it and keep building and that's um that's really good to see so as a as a player i very much appreciate it as a guy who relies heavily on your stuff because we still rely on transfer settlements to edit any of our city plans um thank you so much for all the work you put in well thank you for saying that <laughs> and uh, yeah this uh this is uh absolutely motivating for me and uh, i'm really glad i can uh, create tools that uh, you can use them for amazing mods such as sim settlement well i think we're going to see a whole bunch of amazing mods and things come out of that next set of tools you've got so um i know before we started the podcast we talked about how we hate revealing too many of our plans too early because then people start bugging about uh, them about us but um i think everybody now is going to be bugging you about this other tool but you like you said it's almost in release and i think they should be bugging you about it because we want to see it so badly um, it's especially for PlayStation users is going to be a big deal. But I, I think beyond that, I think this is just going to create, this is going to create, I think, so just like with Sim Settlements add-on packs created a whole new set of modders that weren't modders before. I think your new tool is going to do the same thing. I think we're going to see an explosion of new mod authors out of that. So, um, so again, thank you for, for doing something like that. It's going to be really, really cool. I think I'm going to promote it as soon as it comes out on the, on my YouTube channel to try and get more people to play with it. And hopefully then we'll find those bugs for you real fast <laughs> and we can get that thing perfected. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is exciting times in Fallout 4 modding. So many cool things available. And, 
um, I'm, that's going to be the second one you are personally responsible for in enhancing the community. So, uh, again, from, for, on behalf of all the community, I'm going to say thank you, C. Dante, for everything you do for us. Well, uh, thank you too. <laughs> I, I can, I can only promise that, uh, it's going to be released soon. Real Fantastic. soon. Well, well, we'll keep, we'll keep poking you until we see it. So, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Uh, is there anything else you want to promote and hype up before uh, we go to where we can have other things to poke you about? Uh, well, um, I wouldn't go into the details, but, uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> me I mentioned some of, uh, the projects I'm working on, uh, uh, in earlier, uh, podcasts and, uh, uh, here and there on my YouTube on, or on my Twitter. So, uh, uh, let's just say that, uh, they are not abandoned and uh, <laughs> not forgotten and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really working on to finish everything that I, I already started. Awesome. Well, we can't wait to see it all, man. Well, thanks for having me. It was, it was absolutely great uh, talk and a pleasure to talk to you always. <laughs> awesome, man. All right. Th thanks again. We'll talk later.